Welcome to the OT Roundtable, a podcast where we discuss a wide range of topics related to the field of occupational therapy. We are here to shed light on things that are happening within our profession and bring awareness to these topics through raw and honest conversations. Today, we are diving into the effects we have been experiencing recently due to the COVID-19 pandemic and safer at home restrictions. We'll look at how it has impacted our habits and routines and also what we can do to adjust to these changes to maintain a sense of positivity and mental well-being. I am Michelle from Incorporate Mindfulness, and here to discuss this topic, I have Brock Cook from the Occupied Podcast. Hi, Brock. How's it going? Good day. Pleased to be here. (laughs) Good day. All right. And then I also have Sarah Putt from the OT for Life podcast. Hi, Sarah. How's it going? It's great. Excited to be here. Looking forward to this conversation today. Awesome. And then our very special guest today, we have Tegan McKay from the Mindful Hub and Strong Minds Club podcast. Tegan, how's it going today? It's going good. I don't know whether to put some Aussie slang and say g'day or... (laughs) Yes, I was expecting something like that from you. What's another, yeah, good day or... <laughs> good day, mate. <laughs> good day, mate. Yes, we love it. Hey, awesome. yarn with one word. Yeah. What was that? Hey, yarn, just all one word. <laughs> so, Tegan, we are so excited to have you on the show today. Tell us a little bit about your background. Okay. So, um, I live in country Victoria in Australia. Um, so I guess down more towards south um, in Australia, if you're looking at the map. Um, and I started off in Allied Health, um, but um, around 2013, I needed a career change and went back to uni to study to become a registered psychologist. So currently, I'm at the. I can see light at the end of the tunnel. I'm right at the end of that qualification and working as a provisional psychologist uh, in community mental health. So working with some of our most vulnerable um, residents in our, in our area, which has um, been, been great. I've been in the position since June last year um, and it, it's been great um, getting that hands-on experience. So that is me from a psychology perspective. I guess um, also you mentioned the Mindful Hub and Strong Minds Club podcast. So the Mindful Hub is our online business that we are currently contracting um, registered psychologists to provide online telehealth um, therapy. So I'm more behind the scenes at the moment. Um, and then eventually when I'm registered, I hope to be able to, to jump on board that as well. And then a recent, um, launch of a podcast I'm involved in is called Strong Minds Club with a OT, um, who works in behavioral change, and yeah, so that's me professionally. And I have two young kids, a husband, live on a farm. That's me in a nutshell, I think. <laughs> awesome. And can we out you that you're in your you're in your closet? Can we say that? Because the kids are out and about probably. <laughs> yeah, I bet a lot of parents can understand that feeling of <laughs> needing a space. Exactly. I'm sitting next to my wedding dress. Um, and like you said, I've got kids out and about, I've got one six and a half year old doing remote learning. So she's currently on a zoom session with her class in the other room. So that's why I'm in my closet. (laughs) (laughs) And we couldn't get her to wear her wedding dress. We tried, but (laughs) did try. (laughs) Just the start, there's still time. (laughs) That would be fun to just show up in random outfits. I feel like we we might want to try that sometime. Um, So you said that, so you're doing some telehealth. I'm curious um, if since doing telehealth, if anything has changed with COVID-19, if you um, have had more patients that you're working with or how that's really 
impacted you from a telehealth perspective actually? Um, we have had some changes through our Medicare system. So um, payment wise and bulk billing has um, come into effect for telehealth during COVID-19, which it wasn't accessible prior. Um, so there has been some changes, but it's still changing. So it's still a little up in the air. We're still trying to work out all the rules and regulations uh, because they are actually changing mm -hmm. at least weekly, if not more. Um, because when they initially um, looked at bulk billing, um, there was yeah some of the guidelines didn't didn't quite work um from a practitioner perspective um it wasn't necessarily going to cover the costs for private practitioners um to be able to still effectively run their business so that's still changing um clientele we have a lot of um currently we have a lot of full paying clients so it hasn't really impacted us um, dramatically, but there is more people um, accessing our our platform um, during these times because of the telehealth option. So, bog billing, if you're not sure, is essentially government funding. Yes, so gov okay. government government paying for the service, but they'll pay a certain amount. And if you can get your service under that cost, then that's fine. Then essentially, the government covers the whole amount, or there might be a small gap that the person mm -hmm. pays between, like if your service is a little bit more than what the bulk billing amount is. Yes, I forget, I forget that our healthcare system is Very dramatically different. different <laughs> yeah. Besides. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yes. Um, yeah. I'm just curious because that's something we've definitely been talking a lot about um, just amongst ourselves and a lot of people in the OT community of how we manage this time and how we still see patients. So I was curious about that. I guess from um, my other role in community mental health, that is completely different. So we, uh, unless it is a really acute case. Um, we're not seeing anyone face to face. Um, so it's phone calls and our organization um, has only just started looking into video conferencing. Um, but a lot of our clients were finding it really hard to engage um, through that platform. So the Mindful Hub um platform and then working in community mental health is totally different um, they're separate oh, okay uh, and noticing the engagement is a lot harder for those um coming through community mental health mm. okay so the people that come to the or that access the mindful hub they have always done it through telehealth whereas your um, okay your patients that are in the community it's a harder transition Okay. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. That makes sense. Well, as you know, we're all occupational therapists here. And so we have been talking a lot about this time about trying to figure out our routines and our habits. We care a lot about our activities of daily, daily living and all that kind of stuff, as you know, and it has been significantly impacted with COVID-19 basically on every single level. Mm -hmm. And so we want to talk a little bit about that today with you and get your perspective. Um, so I guess as a mom, um, you are now home with children at home. So you've significantly had your roles change. How have you been balancing that change in your own life? So far, not very well, but getting there. Um, but in saying that, I'm still based at the hospital um, two days a week. So we're not allowed to work from home right now um, if we are an essential worker in the hospital. So that could change tomorrow. Who knows? But right now, I'm still in the office two days a week. Um, my husband um, is still running the farm seven days a week. And now we have our six-year-old learning at home. So 
Um, her particular school is doing live sessions five days a week from nine till 1230 with a break for recess for half an hour in between that. So having a, a six-year-old, a grade one student, um, never using Zoom or online platforms um, to do remote learning, that's a whole different ball game in itself. So that means there needs to be an adult with her during that whole time. So that's an extra, I don't know, 17 hours or whatever it is um, that we're trying to work out um, where we're getting it from <laughs> and how we can still do our work as well as we've got a little two and a half year old as well. So without him doing nudie runs in her class, like, which he did on Monday. Um, so he was in the background um, with no pants on. Uh, so <laughs> I thought it was class thought it was really Legend. funny. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so that it, it's challenging. Um, it really is challenging. And... We are, we are getting there. Um, I guess with my background of, uh, I really am passionate about mindfulness and developmental psychology. So I'm trying to pull strategies from, uh, I guess, my um, area of work and bring it into the household. And it is, it is getting easier. Um, but I guess what I'm, I'm doing the most um i think i got sidetracked from your question um we're just trying to be okay with when things don't go to plan it's okay so with the so yeah. the, in in victoria obviously you're on a slightly i think your term your school term starts i think a week earlier than ours up here did you notice so obviously the the school having their live sessions sort of each morning is a good way of keeping, I guess, the kids routine. Did you notice a difference? Cause you guys have only just started last week. Wednesday. Did you yeah. notice? So you had two weeks of school holidays before that, probably a bit more, I think three weeks. Um, <laughs> did you notice a change in uh, well, uh, the six year old essentially from that sort of three weeks of sort of no structure, no routine of the holidays and then going back into um, this, new routine new structure that was very different to before the school holidays when they were actually going to school and that kind of thing was there a big yeah. difference in, them, in so the our group? school each school is very different um, independent schools are different from the state schools and then the catholic schools are different again so um our independent school the week before holidays actually went online so the kids got a bit of a taste of what it was going to be like after the school holidays. So it was a, a novelty for that week. And then even last week we had two days. When, uh, yeah, we had a few days um, and still a novelty. Um, but yesterday there was tears, there was meltdowns. Um, so the novelty wore off pretty quickly. Um, Although I think structure, and we'll probably talk about it more, is really important in these times, um, it is a huge change. Um, it's, it's a massive change. And so I'm finding a lot of changes in mood um, can, yeah, can be within a short space of time. It can be within an hour. We've got every different emotion and mood <laughs> happening. I think I can relate to that. Yeah, not just, just myself. Yeah, <laughs> right. Not just yeah, the clients in community mental health, totally seeing that as well. That's the thing. Like, I also, I'm working from home well, full time now. Um, one of the things I've noticed in myself is like, there's a lot of, you know, stuff on social media out there going, oh, you need to build a routine and build these habits and try and keep things to the norm. I'm like, Wait, this is not normal. This is not a normal situation. And part of me is like, yes, I need to, uh, maintain some kind of routine, some kind of normal. Uh, mm. But then part of me is like, 
that's like being able to adapt to change is one of the things that we use to actually build things like resilience. And so I'm like, in one hand, I'm like, I need to do this. On the other hand, I'm like, if you just run with this and do the best you can and it's okay, you're going to come out stronger at the end of it kind of thing. I don't know if anyone else can relate to Sarah. Have you had similar? Cause you're doing telehealth now as well, aren't you? Oh yes. Yeah. Everything, everything's been at home and I've pretty much been at home now for six weeks, I want to say. Uh, and so it has been a roller coaster. Definitely. I feel those emotions. Like when you said that, I was like, are you talking about your kid or you? Cause like, I, I feel it. And <laughs> I have good days. I have bad days. And I have days where I'm like, this is awesome. I can do this. Like I got it. And then the next day I'm like, what am I doing? And really trying to, I think, instill the value of routines and trying to keep some sense of normalcy, but then also allowing myself a little bit of grace when I am kind of going through a a tough kind of emotional period or like, I don't even know if I've been able to put words to it yet, but I'll just kind of have moments where I I have like no energy. I don't want to think about anything. And I think that's just my body trying to process what's going on. And so it's, it's really like, it's not really trying to find that balance, but it's, it's understanding that we can both be productive and keep routines, but then also allow, our time, allow ourselves time to grieve and process and try to bring awareness of what we're all going through right now. Yeah, and I think our limbic system is in overdrive. It, it, it's telling us we're in danger. We're hearing about... Uh, if we've got the news on in the background, if we're scroll, scrolling through our, our social media feeds, even our general conversations are centered around COVID-19. So we've in this sense of danger, our, our nervous system and our mind doesn't know, are we in fight, flight, freeze or shut down? So I think that um, that is how I try and explain it to my clients in community mental health, that it's okay that our moods are changing so rapidly because our, our, our body thinks we're in danger and, and doesn't know which cycle to go into. Mm -hmm. I loved how you said, um, just like doing the best that you can also. And, um, the words that Sarah used showing herself some grace. I really, I really liked that because, um, I think along with what Brock was saying, I see all these like memes on social media and ones like all these challenges to read all these books and self like help. Have you guys seen that? It's like a calendar of all these different books that you can read to like create a new habit and boost your productivity. Um, And then there's also the like, um, what is it? The relax, the bingo, like all the things that you've done during quarantine, like make banana bread for sure done that (laughs) and like stay in your PJs all day. And it's like, we're kind of being pulled these two different ways and we're not really sure what to do about it or, or how to be. So what, what do you think are some ways that we can be present with what's happening, but still have some structure? I think that that's something personally that I'm struggling with. I think that for me personally and what we're um, talking to our clients about um, is turning off the news, like simply just not having it on. Um, I'm assuming it's the same over in the States as it is in Australia, that there's lots of a different opinion pieces and lots of guessing and there's no real answers. But if you're constantly hearing that all day or, um, and then you go on social media, seeing the same stuff um, or um, I guess, yeah, if it's constantly happening, um, we're exposing ourselves to more pressure or secondhand grief. So turning, turning, all news outlets off um, is my number one um, because if it's not on, I'm not privy to it. So if I want to maybe once a day 
look at the updates um, because I'm still working at the hospital part time. I do get updates um, mm -hmm. every time I'm in there. So I'm genuinely just waiting for that. Um, mm -hmm. So that's my, I guess, most simplistic, um, I guess, thing that I'm doing is turning off uh, media. I think where you get your, your news and your information from too can have a massive impact because I've found myself uh, like Facebook to me is just at the moment ridiculous. Like I just can't even deal with the amount of different opinions and conspiracy theories and all sorts of just rubbish that essentially is taking up my emotional space and it's just draining. Like I would find myself at like for the first time ever, like actively avoiding it because it was just too much. Whereas, and then even some news outlets are like that as well in Australia, some channels, their news is better than others uh, in my opinion. Um, so I've essentially chosen one, like one news program that I'll watch and it's usually in the morning. It's what I was doing before this. Uh, I'll get my updates for the day and then that's it. I try and stay away from the rest of it because a lot of it is, I think what, what might be, I think challenging a lot of people is if you get all your news from Facebook, which isn't uncommon nowadays, there are so many conflicting views. It's like, well, who do you believe? Like, what, what are you supposed to do? There's this person saying it's fake and that we should all be going outside. There's this person mm -hmm. saying, don't be stupid, stay home. There's this person saying something in between. Like, who do we believe? Like, what are you supposed to do? And then it's like, well, I need this information to be able to develop my routine or develop what I'm going to do my work day and what it's going to look like. I need that some information, but what information out of that myriad of different opinions am I supposed to believe what's true? What's going to do me the best. And I think that's something that I've found a lot of people because at the moment, everything with the, the isolation that, you know, 99% of the world is currently going through, that information is having a direct impact depending on which, you know, side or who you believe is having a direct impact on what you do and how you do it. And I think that is creating tension among people as well that actually, you know, subscribe to various theories about it, you know. If you're someone that believes that 5G is giving you coronavirus, then staying home is probably the worst thing you could do because you're just sitting there being exposed to, you know, fake waves. Um, As you're yeah. talking, Brock, I felt myself like, like that. I just like physically felt my shoulders and everything this. Yeah. And I, I hadn't really realized that the two, it's like, this is our only access to the outside world and it's mm. so conflicting all the time. And then tell you said that I hadn't really realized how I was feeling a lot. Exactly. It's like some people are having rallies. There was just one here last weekend in Utah where people were coming with that a thousand people that gathered in a park to protest. And then you have on the other end, people in the medical community that um, we are there's risk of, or we're worried about running out of medical supplies and, and PPE and stuff like that. And it's like this constant back and forth. And so anyway, I, as you were talking, I just physically was like feeling that tension, Thanks. you know, it's, it's exactly right. And I feel like, um, there's still, like conflict within fields as well. So you, um, even within like the medical field and the scientific world, there's still so much overlapping and contradictory information. So it's like, where do we go to get the right answer? And I think there isn't a, the, there isn't the right answer right now. <laughs> but yeah, I think people, one, people need to be okay with that. Sorry, Sarah. No, that's okay. One of the things that I've noticed, I I feel like I, in the beginning, I was that person like watching the news and I was on social media and I was intaking all the information I could. And I got to the point that I was like, okay, I need to limit what I'm doing and what I'm, what I'm kind of choosing to bring into my life. But 
when I'm at home, I'm fine. When I do have to go to the market and I'm not leaving my house very often to do this, like maybe once a week, which I actually just went yesterday, I am starting to realize how much, like how taxing that actually is to go out into the real world because I've been limiting my information, still trying to stay on top of like what's going on and what the regulations are. But once I go out into the real world, like I just got this like full sense of like overwhelm when I was at the market yesterday, everyone had masks on and because people have masks on, you can't see if anyone's smiling. So everyone just looks like super, just kind of just sad and like, I don't like really just kind of melancholy. And I just noticed this whole mood, like people are, you feel like people, they're judging and they're looking at you, they're watching your every mood. And so even though like I have been trying to limit what I've been exposing to myself to all of a sudden, like at certain points, I'm just like, whoa, it's like, I don't even know. It's, it's just kind of that, I don't know. I don't even think I have words for it. It's just kind of that crazy experience that I not quite sure how to navigate it at this point, even though I am really trying to limit what I am bringing into my life. And it's hard. I feel like there's, you mentioned judgment as well. Um, you said you literally go out once a week to get your food um, and still feel that sense of judgment, um, which is to we're noticing it here as well. Um, but I don't know what your restrictions are like in supermarkets, for example, but ours um, are, are packed. <laughs> um, it's really bizarre. I think people are really just confused about um, you can't go to a beach by yourself. A lot of our beaches are now closed um, in Australia, but we can be in a supermarket um, with hundreds of people at a time. So, um judgment for going for a walk around the block um it, it's it's tricky um but like brock said as well trying to be okay with the unknown and it's really unsettling and we've got to be quite vulnerable to do that i think that's, you have oh sorry, oh, sorry. You Somebody. You go. oh i was just curious if you have any anything that maybe you've tried or any suggestions because I totally agree with the limiting news or, or being more conscious of where we, we get our news from, but maybe when we're going out in the community or things like that, ways to stay grounded, kind of stay intentional or to, to, I don't know, to help navigate that time. Yeah. I think trying to be mindful is a big one. And I know mindfulness is maybe a bit of a fad um, term um, over the last few years, but um, I don't believe it is. We had a brief chat before um, we started um, the podcast today of we both um, did papers in our, in our studies on mindfulness. So there's what 40 odd years worth of scientific backing behind it, let alone or the, um, I guess, your practices like meditation and yoga and Buddhist type um, practices showing benefits. So I guess being mindful of it's okay to have these thoughts. Um, it's trying to not judge them. So it's okay to have the thought of this person's looking at me and thinking I shouldn't be here because I don't know why. Um, or we do know why, but that's okay. That That's their thoughts. That's not mine. I'm going to do what I need to do, and then I'm going to go back home. So I guess trying to be mindful of our thoughts and that it's okay to have all these different thoughts and it's normal, but trying not to get stuck and judge um, particular thoughts. I think I think when I've been to the supermarket recently, it's very much... I guess really trying to focus on the purpose. So like I'm there to get groceries, get out as soon as I can and get back home kind of thing. So like I, I don't, I never used to really use things like shopping lists and that kind of stuff before. Now I am because I don't want to have to like go back and get stuff that I've forgotten. So 
mm-hmm. I'll use a shopping list and that's it. Like I'll focus on that. I don't care what, who else is there as long as they're, you know, social distancing. Our supermarket here hasn't been too bad. They've been kind of taking it really seriously. Like there's security at the front door, only letting a certain amount of people in. Um, they're, you know, cleaning down everything like constantly they've got extra staff i've got security staff they're helping clean down like all the trolleys and baskets and like they've actually been really really good um there's obviously limitations on the number of things number of items certain items that you can buy things like toilet paper for some really weird reason that seems to be this <laughs> pandemic's like hot it's item. everywhere that's so funny that's, though it's all over the world the same thing which is weird but i mean that's probably the one thing i have felt judgment on is buying toilet paper i'm like i'm not hoarding it i need it it's one packet <laughs> leave me alone i'm buying this because i need it um <laughs> but uh, yeah i think so i guess probably fits into the mindfulness vein is just sort of really for me anyway is really being clear and staying focused on the purpose and sort of i guess keeping that front of mind uh, when i have been doing things that, you know, even like you were talking about before, going for a walk around the the neighborhood or around the block or whatever you're doing. That's the, like the purpose is so that, you know, physical exercise so that I can actually keep working without pulling my hair out. Uh, And I I don't know what the ruling is in the States, but that's one of the things that in Australia we've been told we can do. One of the only times you're allowed to go outside is for groceries, medical reasons or exercise as long as you're still adhering to social distancing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, taking the dog for a walk is fine. But I, I and I have, you know, like I said, I usually put my headphones in, listen to a podcast and just ignore everyone else while I'm doing it. But I have heard of people, or seen people on Facebook and, and other areas complaining about, you know, people being outside. I'm like, you're allowed to for certain things. It's okay. You're not going to catch COVID off yourself so it's fine just chill i think one of the things that i've noticed and this ties into both the physical activity but also the mindfulness part is when i do go out for a walk or a run or like any time that i'm able to go outside even if it's just sitting in like my little patio that i have i now am like taking everything in and i think it's because I'm not going outside as, as much as I usually do. And so I guess I typically like just kind of like head down, like keep doing what like my typical routine is. And now when I get outside, I'm like, wow, look at that tree. Look at that flower. Oh, that dog, that dog's so cool. Like, and I'm like taking in every single small detail, but like, I like analyzing it and like, it just it like makes me happy. So I'm, I'm almost being like, I don't know, maybe even like overly mindful of everything because that's my time to like get out and be able to do stuff, but then also bring in some of that physical activity because I am a very active person and being inside and being working like at a computer, I've realized that I'm not moving at all or very little compared to what I usually do. And so like really being able to get outside get the air get the sunlight but then also just being able to like move your body is so so important i'm nodding my head big time because i think that's something that i've really realized um for my mental health is that if i don't get some form of physical exercise it has a really big impact on how i feel and I have really had to structure that into my routine because I normally go to yoga classes and all the studios are closed and I can't go to the gym like I used to. And so I've had to kind of get creative. Um, I feel like probably you you guys already know a lot about mindfulness, Brock and Sarah, but I feel like you were already listing like mindful things, right? (laughs) Like, Sarah, like being aware of your senses, like just being outside and paying attention to what you're seeing and experiencing and um, bringing you to the present moment. Totally. Yeah. And um, I think connecting with our body is huge. Yeah. And, And by connecting with our bodies, I guess to elaborate on that, it's um, 
noticing, noticing what's going on, noticing our moods, noticing um, even physical aches and pains. Is there headaches? Is there, if I'm feeling funny in my tummy, am I also feeling a bit anxious or nervous? Um, so it's, this, I guess, the forced simplicity that um, we now have. It's, it is allowing us to, to connect better mm-hmm. if we're open to it. Mm-hmm. Sarah, how have you found? Because I know you're working from home, at least partly, mostly at the moment as well. How have you found it productivity wise? Because that's something I've been struggling with. Because so I used to do some work from home intermittently before all this happened anyway. Like if there was something, a task I could do at home or my home setup was better suited to it, I'd do it from home. And I always found like, I always work better at home. That was always a thing like, a, you know, it's a more comfortable environment. That's my spot. But I think now it doesn't, maybe it still is that way and I'm just perceiving it differently, but it doesn't feel like the super productive space that it was before all this happened. And I'm kind of wondering whether it was just that the option's been taken away. Um, how are you finding it like productivity wise working from home? now your boss might watch this just kidding <laughs> right That's fine. I'll tell you. Knows. like i've been taking naps yeah. <laughs> do you guys call them naps what do you yeah. call you say nap yeah. Yeah, okay no, no. okay i don't know if there was a funny we don't, we don't change every word you guys have like sayings for everything there's got to be like a midday nap saying <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't yeah. be in there it'd be arvo which you guys don't know <laughs> but yes yeah, I have, I'm curious as well about the productivity because I've noticed the same. Yeah, it's, it's been a struggle. And I think when you think about not for me, I spent a lot of time in the car because I see all my clients in their houses. So I was constantly moving. I was constantly out. I was constantly doing things. When I think about not having to drive, not having to sit in traffic, not having to park, not having to walk into my clients' houses. I'm like, wow, that is so much more time that I have in my day. And I would think I'd be able to get even more done. And what I'm realizing is, is that we still have the exact same amount of time in our day that we used to. Now we just have different things that are either occupying our time or occupying our brain space. And so it's been a really big adjustment because I will see people that are just, they're killing it online and they're building products and they're writing blog posts and they're putting out all sorts of content. And here I am, like, I've barely gotten out of bed that day. And I'm like, what is going on? Like, I need to be using this time. So it's this struggle of wanting to be productive, knowing that I have all day to get stuff done. And then all of a sudden I like look up and I'm like, it's dark. And I've done one of the 10 things that I wanted to get done today. So I have not figured it out. Uh, I have been trying to abide more by a schedule and trying to batch my time a little bit. And I think I've also been breaking down. So rather than having 10 things to get done, I'm focusing on like one or two, maybe three things a day. And sometimes I'll do it. And sometimes I'll get half of one of them done but really just trying to figure out what the best thing that I need at that moment, because we're all kind of going through this processing and this grieving and trying to figure out what's going on. And that's a lot to manage on top of just a regular schedule to begin with. So I don't know if I have any good answers, but it's, it's definitely been a struggle for me. And I'm, also somewhat used to doing stuff at home too. So it wasn't a huge transition, but in the, in it, but also it, it was a huge transition. So weird. <laughs> oh, that makes perfect sense. And I, one of the things I wanted and Tegan might actually have some insight on this is that similar to you, like it's not a huge transition. The type of work that I'm doing at home is stuff that I could do. It's like, it's not hard. I didn't have to change too much. Like I've, been able to deliver a zoom session for ages like look at us now uh but i wonder whether because at the moment a lot of the stuff 
that's being put out there is build routines, keep routines, you know, keep things as normal as possible. But I wonder if there's any impact on our actual capacity to do the things that we used to do. Like say we have, you know, X amount of things that we used to do and we used to do them like this. Now we're put in this environment. Yes. Like we spoke about earlier with a lot of the uh, news and it's like it's essentially a trauma, the, the response that we're working through. Does that have any impact on say the, the capacity of things that we actually can process can do like Sarah was saying, like, just focusing more on just one or two things as opposed to trying to do the 10 things, which previously may have been no issue. Like that may have been, you know, something that could have been quite manageable. Is there any capacity type impact from a psych point of view? Uh, I think you kind of nailed it with um, we are going through a trauma. Um, and so a trauma brain um, does have less capacity or find it harder to um, get things done. So I think that that's a really good point that our capacity is most likely going to be a lot lower um, than, than what it usually is. And being able to recognize that might help us get those two or three things done instead of the 10 things um, because it allows us to be kind to ourselves that, okay, um, capacity, uh, usually I would get this, this and this done, but um, with what's going on, that's probably not going to happen. So I think that's a really good point to make because our capacities are very different to normal life or whatever normal life is. Mm. Do sense. we do we need more when we're in chronic stress? Does our body need more sleep? Actually, like, can we give ourselves permission for needing more time to rest? I think giving ourselves permission for self care in general. Um, sleep is obviously super important, and we all hear it all the time. But sleep, nutrition and physical exercise, the three together are super important. So I guess if we're binge watching Netflix or whatever till two in the morning, sleeping till 12, um, eating snacks um, instead of nutritious food, eventually our body's not going to cope well with that. So I guess in a form, we still need some kind of structure to make sure we're getting those three really important things. Um, so sleep, nutrition, and some form of physical activity. Um, but yes, please give ourselves more permission. I'm saying this to myself as well, while I was up watching a documentary till midnight, um, give ourselves more permission to look after ourselves. Was it Tiger King? No, that was last week. <laughs> that's the one thing that I've seen that's taken over more news than COVID is Tiger King. And yeah, I'm not I was mad watching at it last it. night. Not mad at it at all. I'm done with <laughs> it. So I finished it. <laughs> I was a little disappointed how into it um, my husband and I were, <laughs> but that's fine. So give uh, yourself it permission. Us, exactly. Okay. It gave us a distraction. But our sleep was compromised. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so now it's the next thing. But yeah, and, and I love this because it's a reminder to us as practitioners because um, it allows listeners who may be um, struggling to see that the practitioners aren't doing this easy either. They, they are trying to implement the strategies they use um, in work in their own lives too. It's not just, uh, um, it's, it, yeah, we want to do like a monkey see, monkey do thing. I think tying it into the, into the clients that we're working with is, is a really important thing to bring up because what I've realized is that, you know, typically in my line of work, we're, we're working hands-on with the kids and we're doing very directed interventions. And a couple of weeks ago, I kind of just sat back and was like, if I was a parent and here I am having a teletherapy appointment with a therapist and they're trying to tell me how to get a kid to put coins in a piggy bank or how to position them so they can sit better. But I can't even manage what's going on in my household right now. 
we as clinicians, like we, we kind of have to take a step back and say, how else can we support the families and the clients that we're working with right now? They're all going through this and they're all processing it in their own ways. And maybe our goals for our clients need to end up being a little bit different to kind of help with this awareness and realization of, of the trauma that we're all kind of going through. And it, it really is just taking that step back and having a realization of we might not be doing specifically what we thought we were or what we think we should have been doing two weeks ago, what we were doing two weeks ago, but we can move forward and adjust and really try to pay attention to the things that are currently happening within our own lives and in the lives of our clients to kind of just be able to help them through whatever else like they are dealing with too. So I think it's just we're processing as practitioners, but also our clients are going through the same things too. And maybe they're experiencing even more or less than we are, but it's it's something that we just have to be aware of as we go about kind of our clinical roles. I like that. I think that the more that we can be present with what's happening and allow ourselves to be vulnerable, it gives our patients permission to, to, to be able to be present with what's happening because this is a really tough time. Um, something, Tegan, that I wanted to talk with you about is the unhealthy coping mechanisms because it's something that I've noticed, although I practice mindfulness, you know, just like you were saying, we as practitioners, well, we're all still trying to navigate this time. And so although I have a mindfulness practice, I'm by no means an expert. And it's been fascinating to watch the coping mechanisms that I have emerge. And um, so I wanted to, to talk with you a little bit about that, um, about what is with all the snacking <laughs> We're all, we were all joking that we're all like snacking and then the drinking rates have gone up significantly. Um, so yeah, why is that? And what can we do? I need some other options because I'm just going to be honest with you guys. I was snacking so much. I'm, I can't believe I'm going to tell you this. I was snacking so much working from home guys. The only way that I could stop myself from eating is I put in bleach trays <laughs> Because if I was bleaching my teeth, then I wouldn't eat. And I'm telling you right now, it's actually a brilliant idea. Like I would, but I left them on for like two hours because then I wouldn't eat anything. But then. <laughs> Not with the bleach in it. What was that? Not with the bleach in it. Yeah, I did. I left it in for an hour and a half. And so far they're still, I still have teeth, but like <laughs> I need another up. option guys. I need more options because I can't bleach my teeth every day for like two hours. <laughs> But it worked. It did work for a moment in time. I think you were using a, a distraction method, but I also <laughs> want you to keep the teeth. Um, so maybe coming up with a more healthy distraction method. Yes. Um, yes. And I guess acknowledge, trying to acknowledge it can be hard is um, why am I eating? Is it emotionally or am I hungry? So trying to decipher between the two. Um, if it's emotional eating, then you're just snacking. <laughs> but if it's because you, you feel hungry and I could be wrong in, in this, but I've heard that, well, I've read that if you wait five minutes, five to 10 minutes, and you're still craving um, food, then mm. it's probably more hunger rather than that emotional um, eating. So oh, no. trying to delay that um, straight in the fridge, grabbing um, whatever you're doing. And another strategy that um, this is kind of off, off topic, but the Mindful Hub was fortunate enough to be in um, involved in a university program last year. And one of the 
um, benefits of the program, we got to go to the Sydney Google offices. And so what they do, they have um, food everywhere. They literally have cafes every, I think it was like 20 meters or something ridiculous um, because they feel if they have everything there, their staff are going to be more productive. Mm. So anyway, so with their fridges, they have, the snacks at the bottom or at the top that aren't directly in eye level view. So it's more the nutritious, healthy stuff is the easy, what you see first. Um, and it's more effort to go and get the junk food or the snacks. So don't put the chocolate in like the top shelf of the door is what you're saying. So it's right there. <laughs> yeah, Like what they do at the grocery store. They have the sugary cereal at like the kid eye level. Ah, I need to start thinking. Okay, so my placement of <laughs> food in the pantry. But I like that waiting also to just see. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of bleaching. <laughs> and and other distractions than bleaching. <laughs> For long periods. <laughs> Feel free to pass that on, guys. I think some other people will find that useful. Or at least put a timer. So <laughs> that it's it, You need it's, like a time lock on your fridge. So like, I'm hungry, <laughs> push the button, five minutes. If it, not, not one that sets an alarm that reminds you, but if it goes off and you're still waiting for it, then, okay, you might be hungry. Yeah, are you bored or are you hungry? Right. That's probably the one thing I haven't found. Usually, like, I would snack a fair bit, but I think I'm snacking less. I don't know why. I think maybe I'm just too lazy to snack now. I don't, yeah. But one thing I have found is, like, the like it feels like i'm doing less work like class wise than i would at work because we've combined some that kind of thing so there's actually less class times but i am finding them so much more fatiguing than like uh, delivering in-person classes uh yeah i'm finding delivering online so much more fatiguing and i've been trying to work out why the only thing I can come up with is the fact that when you're delivering it online, you're in control of the session. You have to be on top of it. You have to be kind of switched on the whole time. You know, you can't just separate them into groups. You've got to actually do that with the program, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas in class, you're like, all right, do this activity. And then they do it. The students do it. And you kind of can just wander around and answer questions and that kind of thing. Whereas, yeah, I'm just, and it's mental fatigue, obviously. I'm not moving while I'm doing that, which is the other weird thing, probably because in class you are on your feet the whole time and you're wandering around, whereas here you're exactly as is pictured, like you are sitting right here talking at the computer. Um, uh, yeah, I'm finding the fatigue level of doing some of the things that I've shifted to online to be massively increased whereas things like that i already did online like this like podcasting no change same thing um I, yeah i don't know if that's something anyone else's experience it's just something i've found really interesting that i haven't been able to kind of really suss out yet i think it's just a change across the board and like specifically for me in my clinical role trying to deliver a teletherapy assessment I've done hundreds, hundreds, maybe even close to a thousand assessments of, in my life. I'm so used to doing them in person and now having to do it virtually, I realize that there's so many other things that I will either do just with my body or how I set things up, how I communicate things. And I'll ask a, a parent to try to get the kid to do like one simple activity. And then I realize that the kid's still stuck on 10 activities that I asked to go. And I like realize the importance of like how I actually transition kids from one activity, from one assessment item to the next is really important. How do I convey that to the parent that's trying to have a conversation with us and keep their kid like in the screen and like, there's all these other kind of intricate details that 
I never really realized as such an integral part of what I'm doing clinically that now I have to be aware of. You have to also make sure that like you can see what's happening, that the internet is not disconnecting, that what you're conveying that the family can understand. And so I think it's just this change across the board that I, I think it will get easier when we get more used to it. But right now we're almost like over attentive to every small detail that is different because it's just, it's a different capacity that we're used to delivering our services. Yeah, I agree. I, I feel like we've got a thousand tabs open in our brain. Um, and I guess our attention um, is skyrocketed. The, um, the intensity is a lot more than if it's face to face. Um, and especially I'm finding uh, we're doing a lot of phone calls, so not even video um, telehealth sessions at the moment. And so I'm trying to work out how am I going to do a risk assessment or a mental state um, examination um, properly over yeah. a phone call. Um, I need to work out is the, the tone of voice different because they're distracted because they've got their kids in the background or they're down... I was going to say down the street, that's not happening. But um, if they're somewhere where another person is and they don't really want to open up, um, I can't tell because I can't see. So it really, I guess, our line of questioning and our strategies are intensified. I guess what, uh, what, what I'm finding too is in keeping with the, I guess, unhelpful coping mechanisms is that extra fatigue is I feel almost a barrier to doing the things that I know I should be doing. So like I'll get to the end of the day and even though I've sat on my butt and delivered these serve these classes and stuff, I'm wrecked. And the last thing I feel like doing is going out, exercising, you know, cooking a big meal or anything like, like the last thing I feel like doing. So I think I, I find myself, falling into the trap of doing more unhealthy uh, or not more unhealthy, but more unhealthy in large doses. So like sitting there and just watching TV all night kind of thing, because I'm just destroyed on some mm. days. And I guess that's where, uh, again, well, I'm guilty of this as well, of <laughs> what you just said, but I, uh, <laughs> Um, I guess that's where mindfulness comes in again, trying to separate that um, that emotive action um, and putting in the facts as well. So factually, I know if I sit on my butt for the next three hours, um, I'm going to feel crappy or being exposed to the screen time, I'm going to find it harder to get to sleep, which then I'm not going to have as many hours as um, I need to feel awake in the morning. Um, so it's putting that gap um, in between um, the action, the thought and the action. I like thinking of mindfulness as kind of like the pause button. Like you're, you're, although I haven't used the, I've haven't used it perfectly, <laughs> but um, yeah, that pause. So pausing and seeing like, what am I trying to avoid because I think sometimes that's you know, um, a reason that I might overeat or watch TV or, or zone out is because I'm wanting to avoid how, I, how I'm feeling because it is uncomfortable. Like some of these feelings that we're experiencing and our loved ones are experiencing are really tough and it's hard to watch. And so what we want to do is avoid. And I think that these unhealthy coping mechanisms are just pushing us further away from that. And I, I like the saying, like, whatever we resist persists. So it ends up coming back eventually. And it's Jung, isn't it? so what was that? Isn't that Carl Jung? Yeah, I think, so. I think, was it? I don't know. I think so. Could be wrong. <laughs> yeah. Deep. Um, so do you, we've, I've kind of outed myself on some of my unhealthy, would you guys say, Sarah and Brock, cause you guys, uh, you have your podcast and everything. Do you feel like you're more on the end of like overworking yourself? Like I know I can definitely relate to the, yeah, I see you guys both nodding your head. Oh, yeah. Um, 
I can relate to the fatigue, but I think something that's hard when we're working from home is that the workday doesn't really ever end. It just kind of blurs into the next, the next time. And suddenly it's after dinner and we're still working. And I, th- um, I think that's one of the things that I've been trying to, I guess, toy with how I might be able to like, yes, it's a brand new environment that we're working in. So maybe it requires a brand new way of doing things like the nine to five, isn't going to work in this situation. So one of the ideas that I've been, I was going to try and test it this week is essentially almost like a, a checklist method where there are things that, you know, might be bad coping mechanisms in large doses like Netflix and that kind of thing that I would also include in it. So my idea wasn't necessarily to like, okay, you get out of bed, you work from here to here, you have lunch, you work from here to here, and then you go and do some exercise and then blah, blah, blah. But rather to have essentially a to-do list, like not, not even to-do, but these are the things I want to achieve today. So it might be two work things. I want to train for 45 minutes and I want to watch two shows on Netflix. Um, and then it doesn't matter which order that happens in. Like if I wake up in the morning and I'm tired I might do the two Netflix shows first, but then that's it. It's ticked off the list. It's time to move on to something else. If I'm still tired, I might exercise then early before I start doing the work things. But I was going to sort of try and toy with that more, I guess, fluid way of structuring, not even, well, kind of structuring, but a very fluid structure to the day and just see how that worked. Like I know it's not going to work for some people, the very concrete, like get up at nine o'clock, do this, do that might work. But for me, it doesn't seem to be working as well as I'd like it to. So I'm kind of wondering whether if anyone's tried that or has any opinion on that, it's something I'm considering trying this week. I like that. I think for me specifically, like the, the physical activity, I have found I have to get that done in the morning. Otherwise I will not do it. Or if I do do it, it's like, it's so minimal. It's, it's like, I'm, I'm not even doing it. So waking up in the morning, trying to wake up at the same time every day, but again, allowing myself grace. If I can't sleep or don't sleep very well the night before, like last night, this morning, I allowed myself to sleep a little extra and that's perfectly fine. But I still woke up, tried to get my exercise in and then like shower, get ready and then be like, okay, like, literally my husband and I will be like, all right, I'm going to work. And he's like, okay, I'm going to work. And like, he goes out into the dining room and I go into the bedroom at the desk and it's like, all right, now it's like time to sit down and it's time to work. And then also trying to kind of, when, when I mentioned like batching my time, I'll try to sit down for two hours or an hour, whatever it is, but then give myself 15 minutes, 30 minutes where I can go and just like, lay down for a second or I can go get a snack if I need it, but allow like these movement breaks into my routine. Cause otherwise I would just sit there the entire time and work and like overwork myself. And I am one of those people that I'm not really a huge TV, TV person to begin with. And it's been a struggle because like the things that I typically like to do, I'm, I'm not allowed or like the places aren't open. Like I love going to try new breweries and that's not going to happen right now. And that used to be like my outlet. And so now I'm like, well, I've been working all day. I could turn on the TV or I can continue to work. Mm-hmm. And I like choose to keep working because I love it. But I also realized after a couple of weeks of that, that I was like, wow, I'm waking up in the morning and I don't want to work anymore because I've been working for weeks on end. So yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting, I don't know, an interesting tension and kind of thing to be dealing with. And just really, I think every day, every week, I'm trying to figure out something that I like and something that I don't like, and then eliminating what I don't like, and then trying to build in what it is that I need into that routine that week what if there's something you don't like is still something you have to do well then i gotta figure out a way to build it into the routine (laughs) 
something I've been doing, but I don't know for all of you that are doing podcasts, like obviously you probably could, you couldn't record a podcast while doing this, but I like changing the scenery. So like if I'm reading a research article, I'll be outside and then I'll go upstairs. Like something about switching to different rooms is almost like a weird reset in my mind that we're changing and that it's not the same staring at the same wall all day. And I feel like that's, that's actually really helped um, getting outside as well. So I can hundred percent relate to that. And that's like, I think prior, you just kind of reminded me like when I was working from home on a, like before all of this, like I'd be home doing marking or something and, you know, I'd be in my office for an hour or so. Then I'd go out in the patio. Then I'd go out in the yard. I'd go like in the bedroom, like I would move around and essentially work until, I was bored of that chain and then change scenery. And then, yeah, that, that's something I can definitely relate to. Obviously recording a podcast, it's a bit different because the equipment's yeah. here, but um, for everything else, unless you're like, obviously like nowadays, I probably couldn't do it delivering class or oh, technically I could, I guess, but you know, for anything else I can, it's a laptop. I can take it wherever I want. Your students kind of might feel more peaceful if you were outside doing the, the dog barking and <laughs> Yes, your dog did scare the crap out of me one time. <laughs> it did, yes. Just yeah. not in the hammock, Brock. <laughs> I've considered, I have said, I have, I have said that I'm going to deliver at least one class from the hammock just as an experiment this semester. So, uh, yeah. next we'll interview, maybe, maybe we should all be somewhere random. <laughs> yes. You've already in inspired us, Tegan, with the closet. We're gonna, we're gonna start getting some new ideas here. <laughs> So far it's worked because I haven't heard any noises. <laughs> awesome. But I should also say my husband is here, so I haven't just left my six and two year old on oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it. Clarify. We were concerned, yes. <laughs> Open the door, it'll be like Mad Max style outside. Like I, the apocalypse. Yeah, and that's something that I that's an example of what um, I've had to let go a little bit. And my husband, he's a, he's a massive clean freak. So, um, letting there be a lounge room full of toys throughout the day is okay. We've had to be okay with that. At nighttime, everyone does a family cleanup and that's it. Um, so having a messy house is something different, um, that we've had to adapt to. Um, but it's, I guess, when you look at the facts, like, does it matter? No one's going to see it. Um, and even if they did, who cares? Um, I guess in one in, in like on terms of unhelpful coping mechanisms, actually trying to keep control of something like that yeah. would probably also come under an unhealthy because then it's just creating tension, creating stress that, you know, if you had it just gone like, this is different. The kids are stuck at home all day this is okay. It's not going to kill anyone. It's not harmful. It's just toys. Yes. It's different yeah. to what I like, but it's not the end of the world. <laughs> like mm -hmm. I think that you kind of almost releasing yourself from unnecessary stress. You're controlling what you can control, but not trying to control everything. Cause I think some of those people, that's probably one of my, my worries with, uh, trying to enforce uh these habits and routines and, you know you've got to do this and you've got to do that is the moment something changes which like we've already said things are changing every week things are changing every couple of days in some in some countries the moment something changes everything changes and you're starting from scratch again yeah uh which again that like we said at the very start just the change and the the trauma effect of that change is having a massive impact on people's mental health and there, which is then having a massive impact on people's physical health. Yeah. Another example I just thought of was even just this morning. Um, we, um, our kids don't have a lot of um, unnecessary screen time. That's just something that we've, we've always done. And um, my husband and I were having a conversation about letting our toddler be on the iPad while I was doing this and his sister was doing school. And that's not something that we'd usually do, but this is not normal times. And so I was like, go for it. 
he he it's a uh, drawing app like it's he's he's using his senses um and it's not forever um it's for now and that's okay Mm -hmm. yeah i wonder if that's one of the things too is that people are trying to uh, when they're when they're adjusting their routines in their head they're like this is my new routine as opposed to like i think what you just said is is a really poignant thing and it's really simple this isn't forever this mm. is the short term you don't what whatever you're changing now whatever you're adjusting to now it's not gonna be like this for the rest of your life it's it's okay you don't have to like cement this in as the new permanent kind of thing like it's mm-hmm. i think that's an important point because i've heard a lot of people that are yeah stressing because oh, i can't do this anymore i'm like well no it's not anymore it's just for now like you will be able to get back to doing this and that and whatever um but i think that again it would just create unnecessary stress like if you as opposed to somebody who, say suffered a really bad injury like they've lost an arm or lost a limb like that's permanent like there are certain things that you will never do again like that would be a more permanent adjustment in which we would as therapists look at trying to work out how they can manage for a long term yes that's one thing it's going to be stressful in the time but as that person gets used to it our permanent change it's going to be more and more comfortable for them the actual routine habit whatever it is that they're doing this isn't like that and I think a lot of people are treating it like that, which is adding to the issue. Something that came to mind that I also feel like is a really healthy coping mechanism, but that's also changed for me, but the power of connection. And I think that we're really having to change how we connect with people. Um, but you know, the longer that this quarantine goes on and that we're stuck at home and I'm not seeing friends and family, I have noticed how much it can weigh on my mental health. And so finding new ways to connect, whether that's FaceTime or Zoom or um, sending a text or an email or um, if any of you guys have any other suggestions, I mean, maybe we need to bring back pen pals, <laughs> you know, like the mail, um, it would take forever to get to Australia, but we, so we'll come up with some other options for, for you guys. <laughs> this isn't the like 1800s. It takes like three Doesn't days. it take forever? No. Two weeks. Okay. Two weeks. But I would take, I mean, two Sarah weeks. and I would take like two days. It takes like <laughs> I know. three days That's like to forever. get something from Amazon. I don't see how yours would be okay, I guess longer. Okay. <laughs> Okay. But you know what, but you guys, but I think connection is a huge part of what makes us feel sane and makes us feel human. And, um, our community makes a huge difference and we don't have, that's changing. Um, so I'm curious if you guys had any suggestions or any ways that we can connect. I think, well, it doesn't have to be anything extravagant. And I, I've seen, and I think the states are doing it too, is um, people are putting rainbows in their their front windows or drawing on the footpath. And that is helping with connection as well. So just little gestures can make the world of difference, I think. But you're right. It is hard because we're not getting that physical touch or that physical connection that innately humans need. So again, it is going to impact that capacity for what we're doing um, during these times. But I guess, yeah, just, just maybe making more of an effort to say, okay, we're going to do a zoom date or we're going to do a um, FaceTime um, more regularly than maybe we would have. Mm-hmm. Tegan, what do you, you have young children. How do you feel like this is impacting them? That's something that I worry about a lot is that they're observing how we're connecting with other people mm-hmm. and they're seeing how nervous we are about being close to people or touching people. And uh, that's something that I've just been thinking about a lot that I, I worry the long-term effects of how they will view connection or intimacy. 
<laughs> yeah. So I have, this is what I've been thinking about a lot lately. So I've got a two part answer. So for me personally, we live on a farm. So we have around 500 acres on our main property. So our kids aren't really exposed to, they're not coming down to do the grocery shopping with me or um, they're not going out in, in public as such. Um, and they've coped really well. So they're doing farm work with their dad, their connection with each other um, as siblings. They were close anyway, um, but their imagination and their, their growth has just bloomed so majority of the day they're outside playing climbing trees making a mess with water whatever it is so for us personally they've got closer their imagination everything um in that respect has been quite good but what i worry about and you touched on um is my clients in community or their kids, um, the vulnerable kids that don't have the space to run out in the backyard all day or um, they're vulnerable for a reason, um, whether parents have a mental health diagnosis or addiction problems or whatever it is. It's those kids that I am worried about. Um, so but I don't have the answer. I don't think any of us have the answer of what we do. I know here in Australia with schools, well, especially in Victoria, because each state, our education is completely different. So in Victoria, I think we're probably the strictest on isolation um, at the moment um, when it comes to education. So kids can go to school the campus of the school if their parents are essential workers or they're classed as vulnerable kids. But what we've found in my hospital role is the kids that are classed as vulnerable, um, it's more effort for their parents to send them to school because they have to be up at a certain time. They have to dress their kids. They have to, um, feed them um so it's easier to keep them home so these kids in a um not so safe situation um although it's all well and good to say they can go to school they're not necessarily getting there mm. man so many changes i i feel like to all of our lives um, I just want to, we've talked about so many things and you've given us some, so many great suggestions, Tegan. I want to kind of just review some of the things we talked about. And then um, if you guys have any other questions, but um, one of the big takeaways that I had from this conversation is just um, being okay with things as they are and having patience and trying to let go of some of that control <laughs> um, because we don't have a lot of control and things are changing all the time and to be patient with ourselves. Um, the limiting how we intake information, you spoke a lot about that. And then when we do go out in the community ways that we can be more present and intentional and notice what's coming up for us. So also noticing our coping mechanisms, whether they be healthy or unhealthy. Um, and then being patient with ourselves. If we're super tired and wanting to take a nap, Brock, after you <laughs> teach your lesson, I'm t I have take naps like every day nowadays. So I'm just saying that for myself. <laughs> um, a very real chance that might happen. Is it? Okay. <laughs> And then um, we uh, also just some different, some just suggestions that we talked about of how to help with our productivity, but also I think it comes back to being patient and intentional. I think that that's kind of the big takeaway that I took from what you spoke about today, Tegan. Um, do you guys have anything else, anything else that we didn't touch on or Tegan, any of those things that I brought up, anything else that you would add to that list of how to find life balance during this challenging time? 
Um, I think you nailed it. You did quite well. Um, obviously, we don't have all the answers because we're struggling with it too. So these are just suggestions and hopefully if someone can take one thing out of this, then it's been beneficial. Yeah. I think also just being okay with not being okay. And I've had a few of my friends that have said that and we are all going through this. We're all going through it in our own ways. We're all dealing with it differently. And I think we all want to be okay, but I think it's okay to have a minute or an hour or a day or however long that we're just not okay at that moment. And as long as we can think about it and then try to move forward and do something to get us back on track, I think it's okay to just say, yeah, I'm not, okay. I'm not okay today. I'm, I'm going to have a rough day. I'll, I'll get there. I'll get back. But I think it's okay to just not be okay during certain points during this time. And I think that's one of the things that I just like had a, came to a bit of a realization during the conversation is around looking at our capacity instead of the list of things that I need to get done. Cause I think that'll then allows for, okay, like, your capacity is going to be fluid as well. Like today, I don't have the capacity to do this, this, and this. So I'm going to, you know, use this as a replenishing day and do some things that are going to uh, give back to me instead of take, 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 which, you know, a lot of things are. So, but, or it could be like, okay, I'm feeling really good today. Uh, I got the capacity to try and bang out some of this stuff so that there's less stress later in the week. Um, and I, I feel like that might be a really useful thing for people to actually kind of, and it fits with the mindfulness thing is be a bit more self-aware or try and be a bit more self-aware of how you're feeling and what your capacity is going to be to do things or emotionally deal with things for that day or for that morning or the afternoon or whatever the time period is. But be more, I guess, or try and be more tapped into your own capacity and how you how you're doing at that point in time. All right, Tegan. So we have a challenge for you. <laughs> so we <laughs> don't worry. It's not. It, we're going to be in it with you. Um, so we would like a tidbit of some information or something that we can try this week. And we're also going to challenge our listeners to do it with us. Something that we could incorporate into our life. And it doesn't have to be, you know, in the spirit of allowing things to be as they are. It doesn't have to be anything grandiose. <laughs> okay. Um, well, something I want to do um, so I could make the suggestion that we try it together is do some more reflective writing. So that's something I talk about a lot and a lot of my clients um, find it beneficial, um, but I haven't been doing it lately. So I'm going to try and hold myself accountable by saying it to you guys, but doing um, some reflective writing and, and just simply writing three things that I struggled with during the day and three things that I enjoyed about the day. And just for clarification, like what, what sort of benefits do you normally see when you do this with people? Like what's the, why, why reflective writing? What, what do people do it for? Yeah. So some of the benefits that I, they see, um, a, a chunk of my clients um, will come in and say, I had a terrible week or I had yesterday was, was terrible. And by adding in some reflection and generally when they're in the office, we're talking it out um, rather than writing it down. Um, but I also encourage that as well um, when we're doing our phone counseling, but when they break it down and reflect, they're like, okay, maybe it was a bad 10 minutes. It wasn't actually a bad whole day. So by being able to write down what they struggled with, the three top things, and then after that, reflecting on the three good things, they're able to kind of, I keep talking about facts and factual. <laughs> I've mm. said that quite a lot throughout the, the, 
the podcast today, but it helps um, distract or divert from that emotional feeling to the facts of what's actually happened. So that's uh, something I see quite often. Awesome. So it's almost, is it almost like a gratitude type practice? So, th- okay. So do, do the three things need to be something that happened that day or just could it be anything in general that we're feeling went well or we feel grateful for? Yeah, generally I like to do it on a, a, a daily basis. Um, so making it more specific um, rather than too broad. Okay. So you guys up for the challenge? I'm up for it. Okay. All right. So we're going to daily reflective journaling. So we're going to do three things that we feel went well, or we feel grateful for. And then three things that we would like to change. Is that that we would change or can you rephrase that? So generally I would um, start with three things we struggled with throughout the day and then um, finish it off with three things that you enjoyed or are grateful for. Okay. And do you usually do that at the end of the day? Is that typically the best time? Yeah, um, just before bedtime is is um, is great, but it, that might not suit everyone. So it might be lunchtime for you, okay. or it might be you wake up in the morning and reflect on the day before. Okay, I'm actually really excited about this. Are you guys? Okay. I know. I always want to journal and I always convince myself that I don't have enough time, but I can do three things. <laughs> well, six technically. And, but. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's the thing. We are so used to this busy society, which um, I'm definitely guilty of too, is being busy all the time and we don't have time to do these other things. Um, whereas this forced kind of slowdown um, is a good opportunity to try, I guess. I feel like busy has always been an excuse. At least I know in my life, it's always been like, oh, how are you? Oh, I'm busy. I'm just, I'm so busy. And it's just an excuse. And now I'm like, I'm not too busy. I'm not too busy to do these things that I have been wanting to do for months and years. And so really it is just like slowing it down and being like, yep, all right, like I'm, I'm going to try this. Maybe it's not going to work how I want it to, but I'm going to try it. So I like, I like this. I like this little homework challenge here. Hey, thank you so much, Tegan. We had so much fun chatting with you and We just appreciated all the advice that you gave us. And thank you from all of us at the OT Roundtable. Thank you so much. Thank you. (laughs) 